Fires are an interesting topic to me, especially in the early 1900s when our safety standards were lacking and, well, it was just a different time. What seems like common sense to us now just wasn't back then, and what was regular practice to them is an obvious, fatal error to us now. Fire doesn't care what year it is or how far we've come in the safety department. Learning through tragedy, let's talk about what happened to cause and the result of New York's worst fire in history. The Triangle Waistcoat Company was a manufacturer of women's cotton and linen blouses. In 1911, they were located in Lower Manhattan on the corner of Green Street and Washington Place. It took up the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor of the Ash Building, later named the Brown Building. The company employed around 500 people, mostly Italian and Jewish women and girls, who worked nine hours during the week and seven on Saturdays. Long hours for a paycheck, but you had to support your family in a city that's notoriously expensive to live in. The incident happened on Saturday, March 25th, when a sudden fire flared up in a scrap bin under one of the workers' desks on the 8th floor. Investigators placed blame on the worker, saying someone had lit a cigarette and either discarded it or the match into a pile of discarded scraps. Smoking was banned in the building, but some of the workers still found ways to sneak them in, exhaling smoke through their lapels to avoid being caught. In a factory of cloth, everything was flammable, and the small trash fire quickly started to spread up the desks and across the eighth floor. Now, in 1911, they didn't have fancy alarm systems when a fire broke out, so word was spreading slow. Slower than the fire, actually. A bookkeeper on the eighth floor informed the tenth floor of the situation by phone, but there was no way to contact the ninth floor, so they discovered that there was a fire by looking at the fire crawling into the room. Unlike the catastrophe that was the Iroquois Theater fire, which I also covered on this channel, this building was equipped with many exits. The problem was getting them open. Not only was the fire quickly blocking exits left and right, the stairways that led to the streets were often locked during work hours in order to check the ladies' purses for stolen goods before they left. Real solid trust coming from that management. Anyway, the foreman who held the key to these doors was long gone by now, safely escaping while the workers scrambled to find a way out. Many workers tried to escape to the roof, but the fire quickly consumed both directions, funneling the terrified people into the only exterior fire escape. It was a poor excuse for a stairway, likely to have been broken before the fire. Now it barely held on while people piled onto it until it snapped. Twenty victims fell a hundred feet to the streets below, trying to escape on the one stairwell that was supposed to be designed for this. Those who watched inside stayed back and began to take on more smoke. The fire department quickly arrived, but their ladders could only reach up to the seventh floor. Scattered bodies of those who had fallen or jumped to their death made getting to the building slow as well. Elevator operator Joseph Keto made three trips to the ninth floor to pull people to safety, but after some victims pried the elevator doors open and jumped down onto the car, it became warped and buckled under the heat of the fire. He was told to stop going up on his fourth attempt. People gathered in the streets to witness 62 workers fall to their death. The sounds of bodies hitting the pavement and the screaming inside were enough to haunt anyone's nightmares for years to come. An estimated 149 people lost their lives that day, 123 of them being women and girls. The two owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, were charged for first and second degree murder. But after some nonsense trial where lawyer Max Struer was able to attack the credibility of one of the survivors because she repeated her statement over and over again too well and therefore had it memorized, I'll never understand these lawyers. Their charge was reduced to being found liable of wrongful death. $75 was compensated for each death, because I guess that's all people were worth back then. 
Don't worry, though. The insurance company paid Blanc and Harris about $400 per victim, so they did just fine. This is gross. The owners knew about the locked doors. They enforced them, and Harris even continued to do this moronic act during work hours afterward, being caught and fined the tiniest amount only two years after the fire. Nothing was learned, and many lives were lost. However, in the wake of this epic lack of safety measures, this fire resulted in the American Society of Safety Professionals on October 14, 1911. This gave me Major Radium Girls vibes, what with the mistreatment of women in the workplace and the lawyers trying to destroy their credibility after the fact. It's hard not to get mad about it, even over a hundred years later. Thanks for watching. For more true crime and horror, please consider subscribing. Game with me on Twitch, follow me on Twitter, and as always, be well. <laughs>